Donald Trump gets reelected, what? The city's burned. Times to be organized and orchestrated chaos. They call everybody they disagree with Nazis. I felt like I had no choice but to do what I did. So yeah, kill them. Kill the Nazis. Long live the Socialist Revolution. And when conditions become right, people do get the opportunity to change the whole system through a revolutionary struggle. The International Revolutionary People's Guerrilla Forces work to defend social revolutions around the world. We gotta fight it out. We're gonna remake this country in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Liberals get the f***ing wall first. Someday, we gotta knock those mother to control this thing right on their ass. Wow. You know, we, we actually released that. So that's a documentary we did last year, um, and we called it Antifa, Rise of the Black Flags. It's still available. You can go watch that full movie. It's a feature-length film that we did uh, with myself and some of my great friends out there, uh, Raheem Kassam, um, Lee Smith, just a ton of people out. And so you go to antifamovie.com. You can watch that full thing. And thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for being here to take time to just, you know, listen to, you know, a kid from Philly, you know, tell stories about what, what is going on in our country and that it's so important to be here. There's so many different things you could be doing tonight. There's so many uh, better uses of everyone's time. Believe me, I, I wish we didn't have to talk about this stuff, but I think that we do. And so it occurred to me, because I'm speaking here at Colorado Christian for the first time, that usually... I kind of end my talks when I give talks with this, but I thought that since this is a Christian university, right, that we might as well finish with the answer. Would you like that? Would you like to finish with the answer? It's really simple, ladies and gentlemen. The answer is God. You need to return God to the public space. That is how we fix this. That is how we get out of this situation. And every time they tell you that you can't go to service or that you can't worship or I'm sorry, there's no room at the inn for you, you know, all all throughout these lockdowns, it was the very first time in my life. And I was telling someone earlier tonight that, you know, the first time I ever went up to a church and the door was closed and there was a sign that said, you know, you couldn't come in and you were turned away from a church, from a house of God. I said, what is going on? What is going on in Western Christianity? What is going on in progressive Christianity? No, it's time for real Christians to stand up and take this country back because as that student said earlier, this country is not ours, this country is his. He is king, God is king, Christ is king. And the minute we get that back, the minute we get our country back. Everyone get that? All right. So that's it, any questions? No. I mean, it really is kind of that simple. No, but I, I come, I do come to this from you know all of this stuff by you know by a Polish background. So uh, my family, my last name is Pol- is uh, Posobic, or you know we actually had um, there was a professor here earlier, and I spoke to the class, and uh, he was from Poland, and so he actually knew the Polish Posobiec is the proper way to say it. Oh, it, you know, you know. So we usually we go with Posobic um, just because it's easier. Polish, uh, we keep the language. Uh, deliberately hard to pronounce to discourage immigration from any of those weird countries, you know, like Germany (laughs) next door. Yeah, Poland's a great country, bad neighbors, very, very bad neighbors. Um, And so, you know, looking at it from that perspective and, you know, also having my wife, she's not here tonight, but, you know, hopefully, sweetheart, you're watching at home or you'll watch us later. You know, she was born, and I talk about this, she was born in the Soviet Union. And, so it's, it's amazing because she was born in a country where they had already lost all of their freedoms and they had lost everything and they wouldn't have the, the ability to hold a meeting like we're holding tonight at a, at a university. This is a private university, it's not a public university, but it's a public space in a sense. Uh, it, it wouldn't exist in that country. It wouldn't exist. And every single one of us would be arrested. We wouldn't have police here protecting us. We'd have police here rounding us up and going after our children. So understand that when you have freedom, you can lose it. 
and you can lose it very quickly. And when you do lose it, it becomes the hardest possible thing to get back. So the time to stand up isn't when things have gone too late. You want to stand up at the first sign of tyranny and do not give an inch. Never give an inch to tyranny. And so, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, we look at it from, and I, I calculated this from, you know, because people look at it and they say, you know, Poland is, as a country, you know, you've been through so much, but also, you, you still, you seem like you're still going. And you've been through so much oppression. I actually calculated this. Remember this number, 173. 173. For 173 of the last 200 years, Poland has either been partitioned, occupied, annexed, or controlled by a foreign system like communism. So in 1795, Poland was, or was divided, really partitioned, by the occupying armies of the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My family's from the Krakow area, so we were under the um, Empire. And um, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Mike Guy, I will pay you later, free book. Not really, it's $20. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so we were partitioned. Then we got the country back in, uh, in 1918. So that was, you know, that we just had the 100th year anniversary of that. I actually took my son over, I got a three-year-old son, and I took him over and we, we marched in the Independence Day Parade for Poland for their 100th anniversary. Now, as anybody knows though, that wasn't the end of the story because about 20 years later, the little thing happened called 1939. And in 1939, Poland was invaded by Nazi Germany and, so, and then two weeks later, Soviet Russia. This is when the Germans and the Russians were in cahoots under a thing called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And so they basically divided Poland down the middle. Uh, my wife, she, where she was from, was from the, the side of Poland that used to be considered East Poland, now, they, now it's called the Republic of Belarus. And so we always, you know, this, the way I always tell the story is when they ask where my wife's from, they say, I say, well, my wife was born in the Soviet Union, her little sister was born in Belarus, her parents were born in the Soviet Union, but her grandparents were born in Poland. And people say, oh, well, she moved around. I said, no, they're from the same town. <laughs> right, because they, they didn't move, it was the border kept moving, you know, over them. And this, this is, you know, a, a, war is applied politics, right? War, you know, politics is warfare without, you know, without bloodshed, hopefully. And, and that's, that should be the practice of all good politics. But then, following World War II, Poland, of course, was occupied by this, not essentially occupied by the communist system controlled by Moscow for 50 years straight. So it's really only 1991 when Poland gains full control of their country back and full independence. So 173 years out of 200 years. I'm telling the long version of this and I'm telling it for a reason. Because people will say, well, how did they do it? How did they maintain Poland? And how is Poland still standing strong as really a, a bastion against so many of the very same forces that we can see operating to subvert the United States today? at a time when, for so much of this uh, period, over 100 years, about 120 of those years, Poland wasn't even on the map. It had been completely erased. And I said it's very simple. It's three simple takeaways that the Polish people never gave up. Their language, their culture, and their faith. They never gave up those three things, their language, their culture, and the faith. And when you look at the left today, what are the three main targets of the left, and not just in America, but in the West today? They go for the language, right? I saw Michael Knowles is coming out um, in a couple of weeks, and he talks all about this. They change the definition of things. They go to, Miriam Webster's, by the way, just changed the definition of anti-vax. Have you seen this? They actually went in and changed the definition. So anti-vax used to mean that you're against all vaccinations. Now, if you go to Miriam Webster online, it will state, Anti-vax means someone who's opposed to all opposed to vaccine mandates for COVID-19. So they've changed the entire language. But understand, understand, this is being done by policy. This is a design. This is a playbook. George Orwell talked about it. Aldous Huxley talked about it. Ray Bradbury talked about it. They changed the language. Number two, they change culture. I just showed that trailer. 
And we talk about Antifa, and I can get into that a little more as well, talking about the work I've done to infiltrate this group uh, over the past five years, going back to 2016 when I started infiltrating their meetings. Uh, last year, I was out in Chaz. I spent about a week out there, day and night, infiltrating this autonomous zone that was set up by left-wing militants within a six-square block radius of Seattle, which is one of our greatest cities on the western seaboard. And it was completely taken over from the inside by this domestic, really an international terrorist group. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because of uh, Antifa's origins do not begin in the United States. They begin in Weimar, Germany. They begin in Germany from the 1930s. And Antifa is actually a bigger problem in uh, Western Europe than it even is in America today. And then finally, faith. And I think that goes without saying, right? It goes without saying that the very first target of the left or the subversive counterculture movement, whatever you want to call it in the throughout the West has been faith. That was the first thing they targeted. In the United States, for the vast majority of US history, it was common for schools to start with the Pledge of Allegiance as we just did, but also with a prayer, public schools, to start with a prayer, to start with a reading from the Bible, and to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, right? This is, this is our history, and yet you will see you will even see conservatives standing up and saying, oh no, you know, is protecting, I think I'm like speaking under the mic or something. You gotta, it's, it's a very sensitive mic. You have to be very careful with the mic. You be very careful. Don't, you know, don't go too far away from the mic there, Jack. Um, and so, all right, okay. I need to... Um, this is part of U.S. history, and for some reason, these you have conservatives out there. Are we going to change it out? We're going to change it out. All right, we're going to change it out. We're going wireless, folks. We're going wireless. Not that that was wired, but anyway, I, I don't mind going wireless, but they did want me to stand this way for the, uh, for the camera because we are live streaming. So hello to everyone who's watching. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. You know, um, and so, so the issue, though, became that people look at the First Amendment, but they hear separation of church and state. Well, I'm sorry, I can read the First Amendment, and I don't find the words separation of church and state in the First Amendment. I don't find them anywhere in the Constitution either. The same, by the same token, I don't find the word abortion anywhere in the Constitution either. You know, people want to read these things into it. You know what words I do see? I see freedom of religion, which meant the freedom to practice your religion in the United States, right? That was about the establishment of a religion. We weren't going to have a Church of America the way that the Anglicans had a Church of England. That's, if you understand history, that's what that was about. And the other thing that I see in the United States Constitution is the right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed. It's very clearly written, and I don't understand why it is that lawyers in Washington, D.C. seem to have a problem with that. <laughs> but it, I, you, you understand that this is the problem we've gotten to in this country, that we've, they've targeted, of course they targeted faith, they took that out. Now they're targeting language to take that away as well. You need to hold on to those things. Words mean things. We can't read context and read all these other different little thing, you know, games they play to try to take it away. And that's the same thing Antifa does, by the way. So you know, when I wrote this book, I didn't actually set out to write a book about Antifa. Um, but I would go to these uh, Trump rallies, or I'd go to conservative groups. And really, actually, the first time I came in touch with them, or they got in touch with me, I should say, was in 2016 when we would go to these, uh, the RNC and the DNC. And going all the way back, to 2016, it's, it's kind of you know, funny for people to remember this because it seems so ubiquitous now, but people used to always say that Republican events were very, um, you know, were very violent, but Democrat events weren't. And they would say, oh, there's so much violence at the RNC, there's so much violence at the RNC. So I said, okay, well, we'll go to the RNC and we'll bring all the whole camera crew and we'll see what's going on and, and we'll figure this, I wasn't with, this before I was with One American News or Turning Point or any of this stuff, it was just me and a couple of guys. And we said, well, let's go and check out the RNC. And it's the first time I'd ever been, I don't know, second time I've been in Cleveland. And it was quiet as a church mouse. There was nothing, there's absolutely nothing there. And I looked at the way the mainstream media was portraying this situation, and they would say, oh, the Trump rally had violence. But they would, the way they would write the headline was, violence breaks out at Trump rally. And you'd say, well, oh, so the, it sounds like a Trump supporter or a conservative had committed some act of violence. But then you'd go and you'd look at the footage, and you'd see it was people leaving the rally and people from the street coming up and attacking them. 
So they, so I'm looking at it, it's like, wait a minute, you're, you're telling three quarters of the story, but you're leaving out who was doing the violence. You're leaving out who it was that was the perpetrator of this violence. The same, it's by the way, the same way they'll talk about violence at the border, they'll talk about the horrific uh, epidemic of sexual assault that goes on at the border, but they leave out the fact that this is being done by cartels, they'll leave out the fact this is done by coyotes, they'll leave out the massive, really just, just human, humanitarian crisis at the border because they say, oh, it's just, about, uh, it's just about migration, it's just about helping people, we need to have open borders, but this is good. No, absolutely not, but because they are lying. It is sins of omission, and we're here to correct the record, frankly. So then I went to the DNC, and the DNC was in Philadelphia, where I'm, I'm actually from the Philadelphia area originally, so I've been pretty familiar with Philadelphia, familiar with all the environs there. The Philadelphia DNC was like a war zone. There was violence everywhere at this thing. But the amazing part of it was, none of it was shown on mainstream media. So same deal. You know, we said, look, we didn't catch anything in Cleveland, let's go to Philly and see what happens. We go to Philly, this thing is insane because you've got Bernie bros and Green Party members and you know, all sorts of these leftists just chanting in the streets, screaming, by the way, how much they don't like Hillary Clinton, how much they don't want her in, how much they think that she's completely rigged the system. Keep in mind, we're talking 2016 in the primary against Bernie Sanders. They had an entire coffin with the DNC like logo painted on it. They threw that over the fence. Then they smashed down the gates where the Philadelphia police officers, this is back when we had police officers that were allowed to do their jobs, um, on horseback that we're about to ride in, and I'm sitting there in the crowd, you know, not identifying myself, but thinking, oh gosh, this is, this is going to get bad. So I, I grab um, this guy next to me, you know, had like a, one of those bullhorns, you know, that are kind of ubiquitous at these left ring rallies. And I said, hey man, man, let me, give me, give me the bullhorn real quick. Give me the bullhorn. And he's like, what are you going to do with it? I was like, oh, I just, you know, I just got to, I just want to sing. I just, I just want to sing, man. I just, I just want to sing. And he's like, yeah, let's sing. Like, all right, sweet. So he hands me the bullhorn, and I get up, and I'm thinking, this is going to turn violent. Those horses aren't stopping. The police, I don't even know what they're going to do. You can see they've got tear gas. I don't really feel like getting tear gassed. It's not fun. I was in the military. I went through the gas chamber. I don't want to have to do that again. Not, not and Later, of course, covering Antifa, you do get tear gassed and pepper balled and everything else. But it's, you know, if you can avoid it, you, you, if anyone's a veteran, you've been through that in the room, you, you know what I mean. It's just, yeah, not fun. So I get, I get the bullhorn and I start singing Give Peace a Chance by John Lennon. And I'm like, come on, everybody, let's sing Give Peace a Chance. Come on. We get everyone to start singing and we get everyone to sit down. But then there's one group of people and they're all dressed in black, black masks and screaming uh, racial epithets and everything else under the sun. I'm there with my brother and a few other people, and we're like, what the heck? Who are these guys? I've never seen something like this before. And you can get the sense that they're not part of any of what these other groups, these, these larger groups. And, they, and then someone near me goes, oh, them, the, yeah, they're crazy, man. They're Antifa, man. That's, you don't, that's, that's Antifa. You don't mess with those guys. I'm like, Antifa? You know, who's, who's Antifa? What's this? I said, I better learn more about these guys. <laughs> they seem like they might be a little bit of a problem. So I did. Uh, I started... And they actually, um, they tried to set an American flag on fire that night um, in the middle of all this. And so they break out a circle and they bring out a flag. And of course, they're having trouble lighting it on fire because they're not very good with, you know, fuel and, and butane and all that stuff. So as they're going to light it on, my, on fire, and my little brother, you know, he's, he's a little bit more, uh, he's a little bit more quick, quick draw than I am, shall we say. So he busts into the group of them and starts like pushing them all away from the flag. And I go, oh, shoot, if he's going, and I guess I got to go now, too. Because what, what kind of brother would I be if I let my brother go in there and didn't have his back, right? So he goes in there. Now I go in there. Now we're both pushing Antifa away. Long story short, we get the flag. We still have it at home. It's singed, and it's scorched. But we have it there to remind ourselves of what we're fighting for. Fighting for that, folks. We're fighting for that right there. And uh, there's a great... Um, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but there's a great Johnny Cash, sort of like a spoken word poem, if you guys know it, called Ragged Old Flag. That's, yes, I do have it memorized. But, you know, it's, you know, at the ends up with, you know, you're right, that flag is pretty, pretty ragged. It is pretty tower, pretty tattered. But you know what? 
we're awful proud of that ragged old flag. We're proud of what this country has been through and we're proud of what this country has stood for. And I think, you know, quite frankly, I think this country is worth fighting for and I think that our freedoms are worth fighting for. And if they weren't, I, I'd be home with my kids tonight. I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be out here speaking across the country like I am because I do think we're in dire straits. I think we're in dire straits, but, but, I think we have the ability to turn it back. I really think we have the ability to turn it back because at the end of the day, there are more of us than there are of them. And if we put our shoulder to the wheel, they are not going to be able to take this country. They're not. They are gonna use every force of nature that they can, they can coerce. They are gonna call you every name under the sun. They're gonna call you, as, as Andrew Breitbart once said, they're gonna call you racist. They're gonna call, call you the next Timothy McVeigh. No, we reject it. We reject the mainstream media narratives. We reject the labels. We reject the rest of it. We are for freedom, we are for God, and we are for the rights of the American men and women, the American people, the American workers, the American veterans, the American police officers, the firefighters, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, the people that actually make this country work. That's who we're for. We're for the pilots. The pilots, by the way, if you, and if you look, it was the pilots that stood strong against the vaccine mandates, and now they're actually starting to back off on the vaccine mandates, all right? That was the American people, the American spirit that did that, and don't let them tell you it was the weather. We know it wasn't the weather. We know it was freedom. It was the new, and I call, I was joking, we had it number one trending on Twitter. We called it the freedom flu. And I think the freedom flu, it's like, I'm walking by a, you know, an American flag. I think a little caught something. I might have to call out from work today. I caught a little of that freedom flu, you know. Sorry, Southwest. Southwest is backing up. Delta just came, just came out and said they're not going to be doing it. But the fight goes on because they're trying talking about laying off police officers. Uh, you just spoke. They're talking about doing it here in Denver. Um, they're talking about 50%, by the way, of the police force up in Chicago right now, potentially going off only 40%, by the way, of TSA is vaccinated at this point. So they have a mandate that's coming up. And keep in mind, December 8th, you know, I don't know if Denver, if uh, December is like a big uh, travel month. Yeah, kind of a little bit of a big travel month, you know, between Christmas and New Year's. So December 8th is the drop dead date. But of course, because if you're doing Moderna or Pfizer, you need two shots. That means you have to start by November 24th. So this is all being lined up. On the way out here tonight, or uh, to be here tonight, I should say, there was only one ticket booth or one security booth coming out of Washington, D.C., because they had only one security, they had only had enough staff of TSA for one uh, security checkpoint to go in and out. And we were just at dinner earlier, and I've got a red eye tonight back to D.C., um, because I love my family, and that they said, you better go early, because it's the same situation starting here in Denver, unfortunately. So this is the fight we're in. And you know what? I'm willing to wait a little bit longer if it means that we're going to fight for freedom. The same way I'm willing to pay a little bit more for something that's made in America versus something that's made in communist China, exploiting the workers. I'm willing to do that because it helps my country. And I'm willing to do that because that's putting skin in the game, right? It's putting skin in the game for where you are and for where you are as a country. And I put skin in the game when I infiltrated Antifa. I put skin in the game when I served at Guantanamo Bay, you know, coming face to face with these uh, Taliban, with Al Qaeda, the rest of everybody who's down there, uh, various members of Middle Eastern groups. And when I lived in China for two years and even prior to when I joined the military, and people said, you know, why do you care about this stuff? You know, why do you want to go to China? And this is back 2006 to 2008. And it was really at the height of the Iraq war and the height of the war on terror. And I was, I was in Shanghai and I was learning to speak Mandarin when all that was going on. So I, I eventually joined the military. Um, I do speak fluent Mandarin, so I was a, a Mandarin speaker, a linguist in the Navy. And you know, I just said, look, the war on terror is here, but it's gonna be, it'll be over when we stop fighting it. China, on the other hand, China's coming for us. And they're coming hard and they're not gonna stop. And, and mark my words, this pandemic that we're in, this was started by the CCP. We are in this because of the CCP, and the only way we're ever gonna get out of it is if we can get them to admit the origins of this virus in that lab in Wuhan, the experiments, the gain of function that they were doing, and the fact that our own NIH was funding Dr. Fauci and Peter Daszak and the rest of this entire circus of, of fools is what it really is that funded this entire operation. That's why they don't wanna tell you the truth about this thing because the truth of it comes all the way home to the United States and it goes all the way back to the CCP. So when I talk about Antifa and they're like, wait, Jack, you wrote a book about Antifa. Why are you talking about this stuff that's not Antifa? You're my publisher always gets on me about this. Just talk about the book, Jack. You, you, get, you get people interested in the book, they'll buy the the book. I'm like, they'll buy the book if they want to buy the book. I think if they come out, you know, they want to hear me talk about what's going on. 
but then we can talk about how the book relates to that. So, you know, when you look at Antifa, going back, and one thing that I learned from my studies on this group is the way Antifa was used, there, so there's two kinds of Antifa, right? There's there two ways to look at it, really. There's what they are and then what they say they are. And it's two completely opposite things. So Antifa says they're anti-fascist, right? Well, anti-fascist means you're fighting fascists. My grandfather, who was the first, um, the first Posobiec born in America after Pearl Harbor, signed up for the US Army, and he, he served under a general by the name of George S. Patton, and he went overseas and he fought Rommel. That's, that's a real anti-fascist, right? That's someone who's fighting against actual Nazis. These guys are not anti-fascist. What they are is anti-you. They're anti-America. They're anti-capitalism. They're anti-status um, quo. They're anti-religion, by the way. They're anti all of these things. But what are they act doing in actuality? It's the exact same thing they did in the Germany in the 1930s. They serve as a destabilizing force, a destabilizing force for the community at the behest of, at the time, it was the, it was the Comintern. So the Comintern was known as the International Soviet, the Communist International Arm. So they were the operations wing of the international arm of the Soviet Union. That's what, communist, or that's what Antifa was originally. And there was this guy by the name of Ernst Talman. So remember that name, Ernst Talman. He was a German, uh, you know, he was a dock worker, the son of a bartender. He ended up becoming the leader of the Communist Party in Weimar, Germany, and he founded Antifa. This was a guy who had was been hand-selected, hand-selected by the, by the Soviet Union, hand-selected to be Stalin's agent in Berlin. He was actually someone who served as an honor guard at the funeral of Vladimir Lenin, right? This was the founder of Antifa, not some you know, anti-Nazi uh, anti force in Germany. No, no, no. Card-carrying, dyed-in-the-wool communist. And to the point, their original target, and this is very, it's very, I think, illuminating when you look at the original Antifa and the way they were used, and then you look at Antifa today and the way they're used, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but, because I've got a video that actually kind of proves what I'm talking about here, it's kind of amazing. It's just, the video just came out today, um, which is incredible. I've been talking about this for almost a year and a half, and it just, this video just came out that kind of proves everything. So they were used not to, the original Antifa did not target the National Socialist Workers' Party. No, 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 no. Don't let them tell you otherwise. The original Antifa targeted the Republic. They targeted the Weimar. They targeted who? The moderates, the mainstream parties. Why? Because they wanted to overthrow them. And they thought that if they could target those uh, that were in power at the time with the help of others who were also targeting those, which included, by the way, the National Socialist Democrat Workers' Party, that they would then be the ones in charge. Well, of course, we know how that turned out. Ernst Talman did not become the leader of Germany after the fall of the Weimar Republic. The communists did not become over it, no. It was Adolf Hitler, and Ernst Talman wound up in Buchenwald with a bullet in his head after agreeing to follow all those orders from Joseph Stalin, right? That's what they turned out to be, useful idiots. So they're useful idiots to destabilize a country. So when you look at Antifa today, now, Antifa started again in Europe in the 1980s, uh, particularly with Germany, and then spreading into France, spreading into Italy. Uh, there was someone just came up to me earlier. I can't say, oh, there you are. And you, you were in Italy, what, two years ago? Two years ago, 2019, or three years ago, 2019. And she, no, it's two. And she comes up and saw graffiti for Antifa, fresh graffiti for Antifa in, was it Venice? In Venice, Italy and seeing Antifa graffiti up. And you would say, now if you look at that, you might think, oh my gosh, that's crazy. But if you read the book, <laughs> you would know that that's, that's actually where they got their start. This was kind of, the Central Europe was the hotbed of Antifa, it was the birthplace of Antifa. And it's the same way for the modern version of Antifa. But, and here's my contention, if you've been following the violence that uh, happened all throughout 2020, the greatest riots this country has ever seen, $2 billion, Thousands of police officers wounded, three dozen people killed, including people who were shot to death in Chaz, uh, in Seattle, in that six block radius where I had infiltrated after I had gotten out. Thank God I got out before the shooting started. Uh, there were guns drawn when I was there. We had nine millimeters um, locked and loaded right in front of myself, and I was with my brother again and some other guys. And, you know, we didn't go in with, I, you know what I oh, it's not even on me right now, but I went in with my phone and you know, a couple of power bars, and that was it. 
right? You know, you have to dress the part. You have to look the part if you want to go into one of these things. And, you know, my wife was like, uh, people ask her sometimes, they say, you know, why do you let him go to this stuff? And she, her response is usually like, do you think I could stop him? <laughs> you know, so she, she knows. However, if you saw that, um, that clip that they showed at the very end, and it's, it's on the cover of the book if anyone has it, I don't usually tell this story about what happened that day where I'm, I'm like face to face with the Antifa goon. And um, yeah, that's not a staged photo, by the way. That's, that's the real deal. And if anybody's watching that live, uh, it happened last summer in 2020. So the story behind that is, I was covering an event in Washington, D.C., where BLM and Antifa were, had joined up, as they usually do, to say they were going to tear down a statue. And I remember tearing down statues was a big part of what happened in 2020. Well, what they said they were going to do was tear down a statue of Abraham Lincoln, you know, the noted racist and the uh, pro-slavery and Confederate, you know, Abraham Lincoln, right, obviously. And so... It's actually the statue itself. Uh, if you if you learn the history of the statue, was selected by one of Abraham Lincoln's advisors, a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass, of course, himself a former slave who goes on to be one of Lincoln's great advisors throughout the Civil War, and then thereafter, after the assassination, he becomes, you know, not, not only a defender of Lincoln's legacy, but also talking about what what happened. And so this was. The original was built in the 1870s. This was the original Lincoln Memorial before the much, much grander one that, of course, everyone knows that's down on the mall. Uh, it's on the back of all your pennies, for those of you that aren't using crypto yet. Um, you know, uh, for you kids, we'll explain to you what pennies used to be at some point. And, you know, by the way, my little joke about crypto, you know, for people who say, oh, that's just digital money, man. I can't trust digital money. I, I always say, how often do you use paper money? Seriously. You don't. Nobody uses it anymore. Like you, maybe every once in a while, a church collection plate here and there. They turned the U.S. dollar into digital currency while, overnight while nobody was looking, and you've all been using digital currency for years. You've been using it for years and years, and you didn't even know. But that's another story. Um, that's, that's, part of where, that's part of the Great Reset, and that's part of where we're going. I want a cashless society and pro probably a one-world currency, but we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, I'm out there, and it's Abraham Lincoln and the statue, and it was, was incredible to me that I didn't realize, so I'm with One American News when I was still with them, and there were descendants of Frederick Douglass that had actually come out to protest the pulling down of the statue. And they said, you know what, we, some people would come in from New York and Chicago to say, wait a minute, you know, our ancestor put this up, and actually uh, freed slaves had also donated to the, the, the building of this statue, and it's still there, by the way, in Lincoln Park. They weren't able to get it, and they said, "Hold on, you know, this is one of the, this is an actual part of history of U.S. history and the removal of slavery and the eradication of slavery. A huge pivotal moment of this, something that is directly tied to the abolition movement. Why would you ever want to tear this down?" And so I think, my gosh, what an incredible story! I, I want to film this. Tell the camera guy, get in here. I've got my phone out. You know, we're we're doing the whole nine yards because I want to hear this back. And they, they go up on stage, and there's this back and forth between BLM and these descendants over the statue, gripping. Just really great, you know, from a historical. I'm a huge history buff. If you haven't noticed by like the numerous references I'm making, and this really the Antifa book, it is um, very much a history book. So it goes into. Uh, all the various facets of communism and socialism all the way back to the 1800s, to China, to Weimar Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So, and again, stabilizing force. So, turns out one of the Antifa guys recognizes me. Now, come, now, in my defense, and people are like, why didn't you wear a mask? Why didn't you do this? In my defense, it was the middle of the day. There were police everywhere. We're in a federal park. You know, you'd think that somebody would have come up. Federal police... Not so much. Local police, not so much. So Antifa's in my face. They start screaming every label you can think of at me. Then you've got people uh, throwing stuff at me. You've got, they're like throwing water and everything else. I'm gonna grab a drink of water here. Um, and I turned to the guy behind me and he's actually a Hillsdale guy who was interning for us. And I said, look, man, just, <laughs> just let me know if they're gonna smack me in the back of the head because that's the only thing that I, I can't see because we're in the middle of this of this uh, mob, essentially. I think of it more of as a herd. And the, the smell was just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable up close to these guys. And, you know, I didn't realize that I was standing there with, like, my vein bulging out in the picture like it is. You know, I'm just sitting there doing the St. Michael's Prayer in my head and thinking, all right, well, 
if this one swings first, then I go this way, then this one's over here, then this one, you know. It's like, well, I'm, I know, I'm, if I get quiet, I'm just, oh, I'm, that doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. It means I'm planning, but in a different direction. So that whole thing goes down. And then, of course, my wife, God love her, she's, she's at home, like, hanging out with the kids. We live on a lake, so she's, like, walking around the lake. No idea what's going on. I finally get to the back of the police van. They pull me out, and she... <laughs> And I shoot off a text. I say, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll be home as soon as I filled out the police report. <laughs> and, and she's like, and she's like, the what? And then she just starts calling. I'm like, oh, boy. this I'm in for it. Now, uh, I mentioned before that my wife is Belarusian, and she was pregnant at the time. And I don't know if any of you have ever had an angry, pregnant Belarusian waiting for you when you go home. But let me just tell you, it is not something that you, it is not a situation that you want to go into undefended. So for all the gentlemen out there, I'm going to give you a little tip, right? A little tip when it comes to one of these situations. When you screw up, and you will, because we're men, that's what we do. Women screw up too, though. You know, I'm not going to leave you ladies alone when it comes to this. But Men, if you're in one of these situations, very simple. So I get home. I'm super late. She's so mad. Why did you go in there without backup? Why did you do this? Why did you, you know, put yourself? You got, you know, you got one little son. You've got another another son on the way. You know, why would you do that? Why would you do that? So, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the, you know, thing got out of control, right? So I stop off, and the only reason that I'm standing here today. I wasn't worried about Antifa in that crowd. I was worried about the pregnant Belarusian at home taking me out before I could get on, on the news the next day. So I stop off before I get home. Folk, to the guys, to the guys out there, and the husbands, you already know this one. Flowers and chocolate. Flowers, I get a bouquet of flowers and a whole, you know, like a heart of chocolates. And that was like my human shield as I walk, and I feel like the way we live in a split level, so like we're, you know, we're coming up the steps, and it's like, sweetheart, just melted. She melted. And she's like, I was just so worried about you. I was just so worried about you. So, you know, that's that's kind of that story. <laughs> Again, I was I was more worried about the pregnant Belarusian than I was about Antifa. But that being said, Antifa is a real threat. Antifa is a real threat. And and I, I tell the story because it's cute, but you know, it's something to that we do need to be careful about. And Pope Francis, and I say this as a Catholic, you know, Pope Francis recently came out and endorsed the violence of the BLM Antifa riots last year. And this is something where you know, people say, well, Jack, how can you be a Catholic and put up with that stuff? And I say, no, 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 no. How can I be a Catholic and not criticize my pope when he makes errors like that in public? And so that's what I did. And then, of course, I'm trending on Twitter yesterday. It says, Jack Posobiec is trending along with the pope. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, my mom sees that and she texts me. She goes, what did you do? <laughs> my, you know, my devout Catholic mom, she's like, did you get into it with the pope now? And, and what's great with my mom, though, is we you know, she's been along with me, and I'm sure she's watching this live. She watches all my interviews. Only person, I think, that's actually seen all my interviews, all my shows, all my gains. My biggest number one supporter, my first fan, was my mom. And um, I said, Mom, I'm sorry, but I had to get into it with the Pope. She just goes, all right, well, I hope you win. <laughs> and I said I will, because we're on the right side, and that Jesuit doesn't know who he's dealing with. And, you know, thank you. Thank you. But, and because, and look, you know, when it comes down to it, and I say this as well, is, you know, the Pope, we believe in papal infallibility, but he's going to talk about politics, then politics is going to talk back to him, and I'm politics, so I'm coming for you, buddy. You know, you're not infallible when you talk politics. So, I, I've essentially stated this. This has been my thesis. This is the theory of the case when it comes to the book. Antifa, or the Red Guards in China, or the, you know, the Lenin Youth in the Soviet Union, all these various iterations of it. Um, I should probably mention this before if I don't, because if you know if I don't say this, someone, no one else will. Did you know that we had a show? Of, you don't have to do show of hands, but let me just see head nod. Did you know that a president of the United States was assassinated by an anarchist? Were there people here who knew that? See, some people knew that. A lot of people knew. Actually, good good number of people. Usually, that's Colorado Christian must have a better turnout, you know, in terms of this than I thought. Your education level is obviously a bit higher than most people's. I go to places and I ask that question and I get these blank stares. What do you mean a president was assassinated by an anarchist? Well, we tell the story of Leon Cholgosh, uh, who was an anarcho-socialist in 1901 in Buffalo, New York. He was a follower of Emma Goldman, who was an anarchist speaker. And this follows the Wall Street bombings, the assassinations of 
kings and czars across Europe by anarchists, and then coming into the United States, he tracks down who? William McKinley, who was the president at the time, shoots him cold. This is one of the reasons that the Secret Service actually got started. And uh, after he was killed, that's actually how Teddy Roosevelt became our youngest president at the age of 42, when he was vice president because of McKinley. They don't even teach that anymore, that an anarchist killed one of our presidents. So we tell the whole story in the book. And I, you know, I really get into the, you know, the story of the moment. Try to put yourself in that feeling. So I, you know, that starts off, the, you know, it was, a, it was a hot day in August, and Leon was wearing a trench coat and had decided to shoot the president. You know, and it and just really kind of put you. It, it's the power of story, the power of telling the story. But what Antifa does, and what these socialist movements and anarchist movements, they serve the political class. They never seem to actually institute communism of their own. They never seem to be able to get any of the things that they want. But you look at the things that they do achieve. They are a destabilizing force, but they're also a force for the prevailing political class in any system. So that's the force that they were in the Weimar Republic. They were, the pro they were part of the destabilizing program. Originally, it was from the Soviet Union, but of course, we know who came into Germany in the 1930s after the Reichstag fire. In the United States today, Antifa are the shock troops of the political class. They are the shock troops of whether you want to call it, um, you know, the one percent, or the the Black Rock that's buying up all the single-family housing, or Bill Gates is buying up all the farmland, uh, the ESGs that are out there, these corporate social credit scores. They are the shock troops of this authoritarian system, this authoritarian regime that is trying to take freedom away from this country, to turn millennials and Zoomers into a renter class of urban serfs that are working gig jobs, that don't, uh, don't have any benefits, that don't have any safety net, that have nothing. And it's, it's part of this global great reset that's pushed by Davos and Klaus Schwab. And it's called, you know, their motto, of course, I think you may have seen it, it's ubiquitous. It says, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And that's what they want. And I actually found there's a footnote to it in a longer, um, a longer version. I don't have my phone on me, so I'll paraphrase it. But it says, in the city of 2030, 2030, by the way, just a couple of years away from now, they say, not only will you own nothing in terms of real estate. No, 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 no. Everyone thinks that just means real estate, like you won't own a home. So because of negative interest rates, not to get too much down the finance rabbit hole of this, um, that there's a reason that your savings accounts don't make any money anymore. And there's a reason they don't want you in the stock market. They want the stock market to be for their their own buddies. Uh, they want it to be for people like Jerome Powell, who was just caught insider trading the night before the stock market crashed over COVID. The, the chairman of the Federal Reserve today, it came out that he himself was insider trading millions of dollars, selling it all before the stock market crashed the day after his own announcement. So we see what's going on. It's a rigged system. It's a completely rigged system. The Great Reset is part of this. The city of 2030. Not only do you not own your home, you don't own a car, you don't even own clothes. They actually said that. You don't own clothes. Everything you think of as a product now will become a service. And so I just pre-taped uh, <laughs> an interview about this, a podcast with um, my colleague over at Turning Point uh, who's named Alex Clark. I don't know if you does anyone listen to Poplitics out here or that she does like that. Oh, yeah, some got some cute servatives in the audience. All right. So we just pre-taped. It's going to be on the spillover. And, and she, goes, she goes, Jack. What do you mean I'm not going to own any clothes? I'm never going along with that, ever. And I said, I said, Alex, I bet you already have. And she's like, what do you mean I already have? I say, Alex, do you use Rent the Runway? And she's like, I did. <gasps> and it caught her. Because, do you guys, I, I see some people nodding. Rent the Runway is, instead of buying dresses anymore for women when you're going out, if you're going to a formal event, uh, or you know, dance or a ball or something, well, what you do is instead of buying a dress for a couple hundred bucks you're only going to wear one time, you go out and you rent it, you wear it for the event, and you bring it back. They've already started it, folks. They've already started it. You'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. And then, of course, you know, if you get into the transhumanism stuff, they say, <laughs> my friend Adam Townsend, uh, he's kind of a futurist thinker, he said, I think the next version of it will be you won't have a body and they'll be happy. But that, that's, that's getting into the next part of it when they want to hook us all up into the matrix. Well, if you guys know about transhumanism, that's, that's a real thing, and they just had a conference in Madrid. But anyway, and Jamie, if you've got that video, I want to call for it in just one second or for the AV team because I've been 
putting out my theory of the case, that Antifa says they're Antifa, they say they're anti-fascist, but they're actually the shock troops of the political class. And I say that and people say, okay, maybe, but I think they're just a bunch of idiot kids that are out there running around and probably paid to cause trouble in an election year so Biden can win and Trump can lose and all the rest. And I say, okay, okay. Six months ago, I was doing, when we first launched this book, I was doing an interview and I said, you will see Antifa marching in the streets, demanding vaccine mandates and lockdowns. And they, I forget who the interviewer was, and I gotta look it up because it's like just total called shot, right? They take the shot, you know, call the shot, take the shot. And I said, Antifa will be doing this because they're the shock troops of the political class. There is more to Antifa. There are strings behind this. There is an entire hierarchy behind this. We talk about this in the book. Everything's footnoted. We talk about the money. We talk about where it all comes from, the inter these international groups, multinationals, how the money trickles down to them. And then a video just came out of Brisbane, Australia last night and proved everything I said 100% correct. Let's play the video. It's hard, to, it's hard to hear it, but you can see the sign, right? Look at what you're seeing. Pro-vaccine, pro-health. She's screaming about vaccine mandates. She's screaming about lockdowns. And at the very end, anti-fascism. We can see exactly what she's doing, can't we? We can see exactly what they're doing. They're not out here for the workers. They're not out here for the little guy. They're not out there for the vac you know, the pilots, the stewardesses, the you know, flight attendants, the police officers, firefighters, none of it, no. This is the vanguard of a political elite that is pushing themselves and imposing themselves across the West, and they're doing this in cahoots with the CCP. And what my theory on that is very simple, and I saw this when I was in Shanghai that when there was this idea back in the 80s and then going into the 90s when a lot of globalization, economic globalization was, was sort of imposed on the United States and on the West. And the, the deal was basically made like this. They said, you, labor unions have gotten out of control, regulations have gotten out of control, and rather than fight them back in the United States, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to make the United States and the West a consumer culture we're gonna liquidate their assets, we're gonna take away their manufacturing base, we're gonna take away their infrastructure, and we're gonna move all of that to China, and you move all of that to East Asia. So that will be the manufacturing center because we can pay them slave wages, and we can put all of our, pro our plants there, our factories there, we can move all the jobs there, move all the wealth, wealth there, so we can make the Chinese elites wealthy, we can build up the Chinese military, they can do whatever they want with it, they call it foreign direct investment. BlackRock and many of these groups are still doing it today. If you go to the New York Times, I was reading the article in the office, October 9th, just a couple of days ago, BlackRock CEO says, we're going to triple our investments in China. Triple down on investing in China. Meanwhile, here in the United States, you can't find those kind of jobs anymore. You can't find those factories. And then all the secondary and tertiary businesses and that kind of growth that would have come from this is gone. But the people that are on the front end of it, the people who are on the financial end of it, or the people who are the ownership class, well, they're doing great. They're doing wonderful. They're having a great time of it. It's just that everybody else, well, you're the ones, you're just gonna be worker bees now. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what this is all about. We went over there. We brought China into the system. They didn't become more liberal and transparent and democratic. No, 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 no. We became infected with their authoritarianism. Our leaders and our elites became infected with their system, and Charlie Munger and all the rest of them out there are saying, we want China's system and we want to impose it across the West. So that's what you're seeing now is a fight between the forces of freedom and the forces of authoritarianism that have now spread out into a multinational dimension.
Whoa, pretty heavy, right? I know. Um, but I think we have time for questions. Do I, I don't have a clock, so I have no idea what I'm doing here. Um, okay, well, I saw you come over. But, you know, when it comes to China, th that's what China wants, right? China wants to be, China wants to be where we are, or really, quite frankly, where we were. You know, I think there's a pervasive sense that America at some point, hard to say when exactly, maybe 9-11, maybe a little bit after that, but it kind of feels like America sort of peaked somewhere. You know, we don't know, it's kind of hard, it's very hard to pin down exactly when that moment was. You know, certainly the 1950s were a huge boom for America. Uh, certainly 1980s, 1990s also saw an economic boom. But it really seemed, like 9-11, it's a convenient date in terms of, it's something everyone can point to. But it really thing, seems like things kind of changed after that. And that the United, and so you had these forces of globalization combined with the forces that were unleashed, com obviously anti-freedom uh, forces that were unleashed after 9-11 because we said we had to keep ourselves safe. The same way that we had to keep ourselves safe from COVID-19. The same way after the 2008 financial crisis, Wall Street and the Federal Reserve and the US government said, we have to keep the stock market and the housing market safe from all these foolish and foolish homeowners who think that they have the right to try to own their own land and own their own property. Well, it's their fault. It's their fault for taking out these loans when they couldn't pay them back in the first place. It's their fault for, the, for starting the subprime crisis. They don't blame themselves. Go watch The Big Short. Now, The Big Short movie is it's good, but I think it only get, tells you half the story because The Big Short doesn't talk about the government's role in all of this. And that government was pushing this, and the Federal Reserve was pushing all of this, the money that was going out to their buddies. They didn't decide to turn the system off. What they decided to do was cut you out. So they're gonna cut you out of the system. In China, there is no pro uh, private property. The word communism in Mandarin Chinese is gong chan zhu yi. So gong chan, uh, gong means public, chan, means property. And if you really boil down communism to its barest bones, public property, the government ownership of all property, right? That's basically communism. So the elimination of all private property. So when I see a system where it seems like a central power, right? And this is what the founders were against. They were against centralization. They said, we want to keep power at the lowest level, at the closest level to the people, right? This was the basic idea of, you know, you can boil the entire constitution down to that, right? When it, we need to have a federal government for certain things, we're gonna keep it limited, but we want power to reside as close to the people as possible. Obviously, we don't have that system anymore. Because when I look at a system today, I see a system where your rent and housing prices are determined by Wall Street in Washington, D.C. and Lower Manhattan. I see a system where CCP investors are buying up property in the United States, which, by the way, should be completely illegal. It should be illegal for Chinese investors to buy up land. It should be illegal for them to buy up farms and ranches. And you know, we're in Colorado, so you know, ranches, all of this. No, completely cut. Other countries do this, by the way. The EU does this to an extent. Uh, Canada does this to extent, some extent. But for some reason here in the United States, our leaders continue to allow it. And I think we know what that reason is. And I think that really reason has a lot of dollar signs behind it, or maybe yuan signs. And so we have to get politicians that are no longer in bed with the CCP. We need to get a bureaucracy, like an NIH, that's no longer in bed with the CCP. And then we need to get to the point you need to get to the point where your federal policy of whether a child in a school, in a local school board, you know, I think of the, uh, this happened in Tennessee. School board said, we don't want our kid to wear masks. We don't want our kids to wear masks. COVID's not that much of a problem in our area. We don't want the kids to wear masks. Now, Glenn Jacobs, he's the, he does the wrestler Kane from uh, WWE, if you know that guy. Um, he's the Undertaker's like brother, quote unquote, in kayfabe. We can talk pro wrestling in my next lecture. And in most of politics is pro wrestling, though. I hope you guys know that. Very fake and performative. Um, so if you understand pro wrestling, you can understand politics very well, quite, quite frankly. Um, so I've also read the Game of Thrones books like five times. So I'm really, really up on politics. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, not kidding. No, I actually did read them five times. Um, and I don't, look, I had a lot of time on deployment. When a mayor can't set the health policy for kids. And then the governor comes in and says, we can't let the kids wear masks. But a federal judge can come in and say, well, 
CDC guidance from Washington, D.C. by some bureaucrat that nobody ever elected, that nobody ever voted for, can set the policy on your children, then your system is broken, you have central planning, and you have a centralized authority, and that is the road to communism. That has always been to the road to the communism, and we're gonna see that, and they're imposing it now through medical tyranny. We're seeing medical tyranny come out. And by the way, I'm not someone, you know, I'll say it, I've said this, pub I didn't used to say this publicly, publicly um, but I have recently, so um, my family and I discussed it, and we decided not to take the vaccine. Um, so we are unvaccinated, and we're, we're not against it, you know. If, if you want to take it, that's, that's your decision. You know, you go right ahead. Um, for me, though, um, we have a problem in terms of the, uh, we, we don't, we're worried about the efficacy of it. We've also already all had COVID, so we're pretty sure that we have natural immunity. And coming to it from a pro-life perspective, we also know that every single vaccine that's on the market right now was tested with aborted fetal cells and we, you know, we just can't condone that. We just absolutely cannot, we cannot support a product that had anything to do with abortion. And it's as simple as that. It's really as simple as that. So yeah, we just, that's the decision we made. And you just need to have more people standing up to say, I believe in your freedom. I believe in your freedom to make that decision for yourself. And the more we stand up for freedom, you see people like Kyrie Irving, from him, from the NBA, the Brooklyn Nets, to the Southwest pilots, to the police officers, to TSA, whoever it is that's fighting for freedom, that's your ally. That's your friend, that's your partner for this fight because we're not fighting Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, no, no, no. It's freedom versus authoritarianism. That is the fight, that's the fight we have to be in. So how do we want to do this? Well, um, there were cards passed around. Did anybody write on them? If you've got cards, hold them up. Why don't you grab that mic? And Wait, we'll... don't go to his guy. His is like, he's got both sides written on it. We can't take this one. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this guy's got a whole lecture he's going to give me. Why don't you grab that mic out of there? We'll go like this. And we'll, yeah, we need about six feet, you know? Oh, so, right, right, right. No, I could well, care less Well, they said that. to say between the, the flags. Between the flags, right? Are that's we good? Right. Jamie, are we good? All right, Jamie yeah. says we're good. I feel like I'm on, uh, if you guys listen to Joe Rogan, he's like, Jamie, pull that up, pull that up. <laughs> While they're bringing the, um, the questions up, I just want to make sure before you guys all leave to say a couple of things. First, uh, how terrific is Jeff Hunt, the director of the Centennial Institute? Yeah, thank, thank you so much to Jeff. Um, I don't know if everybody knows the story, but Jeff uh, wanted to be here tonight. He's not able to be here, but you know, thank, please support Jeff, support everything the Centennial Institute is doing. This has been fantastic. Um, I, I'd love to come back sometime. I'd love to do roundtables, debates, et cetera, et cetera. And it all goes to Jeff Hunt. And what an amazing leader you guys have here. This is very special. I come from Washington, D.C., and I gotta tell you, there are no organizations like this in Washington, D.C., so huge thank you, and God bless to him and to everyone else out here for supporting him. And it all starts with his mom. Thank you, Mrs. Hunt. His mom's here. He's not here. Yeah. So would you let him come out to play, Mrs. Hunt, please? And I will say that Jeff and I argued vociferously on live radio last Saturday morning about how to pronounce Jack's last name. Uh, and Jeff, I was right. Oh, very good, very good. All right. I'm hoping one of these questions will be in oh, Mandarin go, go Chinese. For the, go for this one. I, I have a good answer for that one. All right. Mandarin Chinese. I'll do my best. No, I'm kidding. National divorce. Why don't Republicans promote federalism instead of promoting an idea that only makes Xi and Putin laugh? Now, if we are Chinese and American, we will promote this Western idea. They are Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. They are oh wait, you said Chinese, right? Wait. Oh, okay. Um, so, no, no. So, uh, actually, the answer, quite frankly, to that question was in the question, right? So, national divorce. You know, I've seen this phrase. Have you heard this phrase? It's kind of been going around a little bit lately. People are saying, you know, red and blue have irreconcilable differences. I hear a lot of Gen Xers kind of pushing this out. I think that Gen X, like, really, you know, embraced divorce in that generation. You see millennials and Zoomers actually fighting back against it, which I think is great. So, of course, Gen X's answer to everything is get a divorce. Um, I'm not Gen X, by the way. <laughs> And if there's any Gen Xers out in the room, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I think, I don't know that we're headed for a national divorce, 
but we might be headed for something that's more similar to a national separation. You know, like we're, you know, we're still, we're still together on paper, but uh, we're sleeping in different bedrooms, we're dating other people, you know, but we, we're staying together for the sake of the normies. And really, really what it is though, it's, it's actually what, what he said, it's federalism. It's people who are conservative going to conservative areas, to red areas, making them redder, and then looking at whatever, if we're going to have this massive encroaching authoritarianism that comes predominantly from the federal government, the only institutions that we have left that could be any bulwark against this are state governments. So you've got places like Texas, Greg Abbott, and you've got places, of course, like Florida and Ron DeSantis, the great work that he's doing down there, that is how you fight back. Yeah, I get to spend some time with DeSantis Friday, so if you're interested in what that's all about, tune into the show a week from Saturday when I come back. Um, vaccines. Why is no one quoting the Nuremberg Codes? And I don't think I've ever heard that even discussed on War Room. Well, I think, you know, not to get And into maybe explain to folks who may, might not know. Right, well, so the Nuremberg Codes is... Um it was the way that uh, in Nazi Germany, the way that they essentially bifurcated society. So, you know, if you were Slavic like me, if you were a Pole, you were given a certain status. Uh, obviously, if you're Jewish, you're given a certain status. And if you were considered Aryan German, you were given a certain status. So obviously, I don't think it's, I don't think what's going on now is the same thing as the Nuremberg Codes. But what I do think you're seeing is a situation where Joe Biden on the heels of being completely humiliated as, and disgracefully humiliated on the world stage in Afghanistan, said, I've got to do something to change the conversation. I've got to change the way people are uh, talking about this thing. So he instituted vaccine mandates, that was number one, but number two, he started demonizing unvaccinated people. And by the way, just to be clear, I'm vaccinated, my children are vaccinated against the actual, you know, for the real vaccine mandates that we have that have been out for uh, years and years, right? We've got all those, like, believe me, I was in the military. They give you, pump you full of everything when you join the military. You go down this one hallway, um, it's basically like, they call it a vaccine alley because you walk in and you're getting one vaccine, right shoulder, left shoulder, right shoulder, left shoulder, right shoulder, and they, and they tell you what it is as you're getting it, but you don't remember. Um, and then the, well, the last one doesn't go into your shoulder, it goes somewhere else. Um, but you get all the vaccines and then you sit, you try to sit down for 30 minutes or so until the bleeding stops and then you go on your way. And then when I went to Guantanamo Bay, I uh, had to get the tuberculosis vaccine because there are Afghans there. Tuberculosis is actually still a pretty big problem in Afghanistan. So I had to get the tuberculosis vaccine. If you're going to, uh, I didn't get the anthrax one, actually. Um, that was only if you're actually going to the Middle East. So for whatever reason, um, they didn't give it to me when I went to Afghanistan. Or excuse me, when I went to Guantanamo. So we, I've had plenty of vaccines, right? I'm not like, don't get vaccines. But on this one, I'm holding firm. I'm not doing it. Well... I give you Jose Manriquez, Denver police officer, 34 years old. Yeah. yeah. He can't carry his kids to bed, so works for me. With the recent hypersonic launch from China, what steps do the, does the U.S. need to take to counter the rise of China militarily? Right, so, um, you know, just to be blunt, there, there is no counter to a hypersonic glide vehicle. Um, we don't have anything that can, we can track it being launched, but because... If you look at the flight path of this thing, we, which we covered, of course, today on my hit TV show, Human Events Daily, no, 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 and podcast, but if we actually cover this, um, the flight path goes over the South Pole rather than the North Pole, and so what it does is it bypasses our early warning systems, which are in northern Greenland or Antarctica, because they've been in place um, since the days of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, this has the ability to go over the South Pole, where, of course, we don't have sensors. And then it flies with a, such a low altitude flight path, and it's, it's hypersonic means it's plus Mach 5. Um, you know, far be it for me, to, I'm sure there's plenty of aerospace people in the room speaking in Colorado. Um, and so the issue then becomes it's traveling too fast, and then a ballistic missile is basically like, and I, I was not, you know, a targeteer or a missiler, in, uh, in the Navy, but you know, from my own background in it, as a military officer, what it is, ballistic missile is kind of like a catapult. Goes up, goes down, can't maneuver. This thing is a glider. It can maneuver all over the place. So the real issue of it becomes not necessarily will it be used to uh, you know, detonate and take out a US city or a US aircraft carrier. The real threat is if it becomes used as an EMP. And so people were pointing out was that, oh, well, it you know, came within 12 miles of the target, so that's, that's not that big of a deal. No. 
This thing is built for aerial detonation. So aerial detonation means it's gonna take out any electronics that are within the vicinity. So it can take out all of Hawaii's electronics, that's of course where the Pacific Command is, the western seaboard, the eastern seaboard, depending where it's targeted. And if they get this thing dialed in, they can then counter our aircraft carriers at sea. As simple as this, folks, you need deterrence. You need strategic deterrence and you need will because we do not want to get into a military kinetic conflict with China. If you've seen General Milley out there, if you've seen these generals that, they, that won, she was posting uh, you know, her toenails and fingernails on Twitter talking about having to take off the, the nail polish. You know, these are our generals, like, these are our generals. We are not prepared for a major war right now. We need to get our military fit, we need to get our military focused on military readiness and forgetting about all of this woke cultural justice nonsense, throw that out the window and focus on the two things that the military is supposed to do, hurting people and breaking stuff. So, or, or, or what I did in the military, uh, stealing the secrets from the enemy. If uh, Donald Trump were in office right now for a second term, would China have launched that missile? Uh, it's hard to say. You know, it's very hard to say because, of course, China wants to show the world their progress. Of course, China wants to also distract from the economic, crippling economic problems they're having as well. Remember, our supply chains, by and large, for the most part, originate in China today. So the supply chain crisis that you're seeing actually starts in China. It has to do with a lot of the energy problems they're having there because they're uh, going back and forth with Australian coal. So coal is their biggest problem supplier over there, but Australia is pulling it back. It's a long story. But China needs to keep their people distracted. That's why they're being militarily aggressive towards Taiwan. That's why they're strafing Taiwanese airspace. That's why they're launching these missiles off because China is looking to distract their own citizens away from the problems that are going on as well as uphold the legitimacy of the CCP, the dynasty, the current dynasty or the regime of China. Um, if Trump were there, that being said, you know, when North Korea would launch something, we would get something, I think they used to call it mean tweets, and uh, I can only imagine what Trump would be tweeting. Um, yeah, maybe you should ask him next week. A couple of really good questions from either parents or grandparents I think your perspective will be really good on. Somebody from the audience also wanted me to say, uh, with regard to the Nuremberg Codes, came from the post-war crime Nuremberg trials, 47 to 49, prohibited the injection of any medicines without permission of the patient. So that's kind of the simple version of what those are all about. And, and as a lawyer, I get people calling my office all the time saying, you know, well, what about the Nuremberg Courts? Well, it's unconstitutional. Yeah, nothing is unconstitutional or against the law until a judge actually says it is. So it takes a long time sometimes. Right. And I think, I think that's what that's really getting at is informed consent. Right? Yeah. Getting into informed consent. Yeah. And I think there, there's a lot of legal implications that we can all push back on, but you need to actually fight for this stuff and you need to be actually be out there because these judges, they're all cowards. Every single one, conservative, liberal, doesn't matter who they're appointed, they're all, for the majority, unless you've got a judge that's over, you know, what age you think on the bench, right? They're all cowards. They all blow with the wind. They wanna be on the right side of history. And they'll go with what, it, look at John Roberts as a great example of this, by the way. They don't even consider him a conservative on the court anymore. So, who are the people who are likely to be radicalized by Antifa, and how can we stop this before it starts, even if we can't fix it within the public schools? Well, I, I told you at the beginning, folks, the answer is bring God back, because I think that you have people in the United States today across the West, you have a lot of youth that are, you know, they're becoming nihilistic, they're extremely secular, um, they think... Well, the only thing that matters is the here and now. All that matters is we live in this materialistic consumer society where, you know, we care more about, you know, who's fighting who, who's cast in the next uh, Marvel movie, who's going to be in the next Star Wars or whatever. And we talk about all this stuff that's fleeting. I'll tell you right now, none of us in this room or even any of our children will ever live to see the last Star Wars or the last Marvel movie because they will continue making them. They are just gonna keep making them because it's just an assembly line now and it doesn't matter. But we care about things like that far more than we care about things that actually matter, like faith, like religion, and like our country. And so if we can get back to that, then I think you, if you wanna radicalize a country, right? If you wanna radicalize a country or if you wanna push propaganda on, some, on people, you have to go to people that are empty vessels. But if you are already filled with faith, 
if you already have God in your life, if you already have religion, then that is the only way that you can be resistant to propaganda. It is the best way you can be resistant to propaganda because you know that there is something far beyond all this other crap that they're pushing on CNN or anything else. I'll, uh, great answer, absolutely. It's okay to applaud. Um, and, and that's not even, I mean, Frank Zappa used to sing about that. <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, I'm going to skip or come back to one of these other Antifa child-related questions because this is just so perfect in light of what you just said. How do we balance our loyalty to American freedom and our loyalty to Jesus Christ? Well, I don't necessarily see them as in conflict with one another, mm -hmm. um, though I would say that, you know, I guess when it comes down to it, you know, we have to fight for those we have to fight for those ideals within the political sphere, and that means fight peacefully, that means holding prayer rallies, that means getting out there. What does the left do? They say, take up space. Christians need to take up space. Believers need to take up space. We were talking earlier, I think pro-lifers need to take up space. You know, look at this issue about the abortion testing of fetal cell lines that's come up with the vaccines. Did you know there's lots of other products and lots of other companies that are involved in this? I think that people need to take up space. We need to be a voice for that, to take these issues. And we don't just put it on our politicians. You need to go to these companies. You need to go to so many of these people and say, end these barbaric, these disgusting practices that would have never have even been approved in the Middle Ages if they knew anything about this, because it would have been too drastic for even, you know, in the times of, of bloodletting and all the other stuff, they still would never mess with fetal children. They would never have even considered doing that. And yet here we are in the United States and we say we're so progressive and that we're so advanced and we're so futuristic. And you look at what we do and you look at the things that we will be comfortable with. Nikola Tesla had a line. He said, you will live to see man-made uh, man disasters beyond your comprehension. And can I just add to that, that remember that our, this is the only country in the history of the world that determined and declared to the entire world that our individual liberties come from God. They are a gift from God. So if you're fighting for the word, if you're spreading the word, if you're standing in faith and in prayer, there's no contradiction with fighting for your country. Those are one and the same. I as yeah, as I, just, I just don't see a contradiction yeah. there at all. All right, our youngest daughter, 24, used to know God, has graduated from a Jesuit university and I would say is very woke. What can we do, say, or invite her to read and watch that would open her eyes to the lies? Older folks like us really don't know where to direct our young folks. Wow. So, okay, I mentioned this. Art. We covered the Jesuits once before tonight, um, but, you know, first, first and foremost, don't trust Jesuits. Never trust Jesuits. That's, that's, just, that's just fair. Say it again. Don't trust Jesuits. Um, I also say, since it's Halloween, don't trust witches, don't get involved with Ouija boards, don't dabble in the occult, stay away from all that stuff, go to church. Um, uh, I got some flack on Twitter for saying that, and I'm like, you're like, oh, do you believe in that stuff? And I say, do you believe in angels? I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? <laughs> you know, there's more to that story. So, you know, really though, what, I, what I'd say with your daughter, um, be careful, right? Don't push. Don't force, you know, you're talking about someone that's been around people for a long time, that's been, you know, has friends that are all going a certain way. It's not fun, right, to be the one person standing up and saying, I disagree. It's not fun to be saying, I don't want to go along with the crowd. But just love them. Just show them unadulterated love and just always kind of just drop little hints. Just drop little hints as you go along. Hey, let's say grace before dinner. Hey, you know, we're all going to, we're all going to service on Sunday. Would you, would you come with us? I know you're in town. Would you come along with us? You can bring some of your friends. That's fine. But let's, let's just go and let's be there together, right? And you just you be loving and you be open and you be positive. And, um, you know, one thing I learned when we were interrogating terrorists at Guantanamo Bay, um, not to compare the left to that, but, well, um, it's the power of a story, right? The power is when you, when you come to someone with a story, you're activating a completely different mental process than when you're coming at them with a disagreement, with an argument. So if you can find a story that has the ability to kind of open up or talk in a certain direction that you maybe want to lean towards, you just say, hey, you know, I heard this great story and it was incredible and like, 
you know, I could come here and say, tell you guys, hey, I love my family and I love my wife, or whatever. But I told you that great story about how I thought my wife was going to kill me. Um, <laughs> but you realized how that, that that was because she loved me and she was worried about me. So, you know, it's, it's again, it's just the power of telling a story, having a good story. And I think it really cuts across a lot of that resistance. I really do. We are scheduled to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, here's an excellent question about just the particulars of Antifa. Maybe we'll make this one the last one. Is there an organizational foundation, military-style structure to what is Antifa? Where does the funding come from? And if you can, define an Antifa member. Well, I mean, yeah, I've, far be it for me to use the, the sales pitch, but this literally is all covered in the book, 100%. So we break down. There isn't an international hierarchy of Antifa, uh, but there is international money that's, that goes into this, so we cover that. We track it back to these multinational um, nonprofit organizations that sort of sprinkle money around, and the money eventually filters its way down. A lot of this happens, by the way, on the legal side. So, of course, you have people that were, you know, you have grandmothers who were walking around the Capitol on January 6th taking selfies, thinking that they were on a tour, standing within the velvet rope, who didn't think they were doing anything wrong. And, of course, you see videos that came out today of Capitol Police officers opening the doors and beckoning them in, right? And that they're being arrested, they're being prosecuted. Nobody will stand up and, and fight for them. There's a few people. Um, but for, by and large, they're getting public defenders. Meanwhile, when it comes to Antifa, you've got massive international organizations and organizational institutional wealth that's going towards funding them, that's going toward funding their legal defenses. You even have the ACLU that came out to, to uh, defend Antifa when it came to their attack on Trump's inauguration, December 20th, 2016, 2017, um, or January, January 20th, 2017. Uh, I was there. My family was caught up in that. We were on the road when they came out and they started attacking the cars. Uh, and of course, me being me, I get out of the car with the phone and uh, all the rest of it. But um, the ACLU came in, sued the city of Washington, D.C. for arresting Antifa, 200 of them. They got a legal settlement from the city of D.C. Um, I have to go back and check the numbers, but it was over a million dollars they got for Antifa and these defendants, they call them the J20 defendants. And that was when I mentioned before about one of the uh, meetings that I had infiltrated, it was the meeting where they were talking about how they were gonna attack my event, attack my friends, attack my family. Uh, they went after my mom, they went after my, my fiance at the time. Uh, people who were just coming dressed up to go to an inauguration ball. And they came after all of us setting fires, throwing rocks, throwing batteries, throwing eggs, all the rest of it. So we break this down. We break through the, the military-style hierarchy of a local uh, Antifa movement, and we go into the Black Bloc. Now, the Black Bloc is this ubiquitous kind of form that you'll see when they all walk out sort of in a blob. This is being done by, by design. Why do they do this? To cover up the ones who intend to do violence, who intend to commit crimes, so that you can't tell who did that. Um, my friend Andy No has not even been able to identify the people who it was that attacked him. We're, I think we're two, two years past since that happened. Now, I will say, though, that video of me, we identified every single person, even the ones who were masked in that video that attacked me, and we brought them all up on charges. Because that's how I roll. So I know you've got a red, uh, red eye flight tonight. Are you sticking around at all? Uh, I have no idea. What Do you know? Is. It's eight thirty. Oh, it's eight. No, I got time. I got time. Okay, good. Um, so if your question didn't get asked tonight, um, you know, get in line, have a conversation with Jack. He's uh, he's wonderful to talk to one on one. And uh, how about a big, big round of applause? Thank you. If there's any War Room fans out there? Steve Bannon's War Room. We got, you know, of course. Uh, thank you for the support. Thank you for supporting TPUSA. Thank you for supporting Human Events Daily. Go watch the podcast. Listen to the podcast. We do 25 minutes a day. Human Events Daily is the podcast. I do this a much condensed version. Whatever the news of the day is, the commentary, go to Apple Podcasts, totally free. Leave us a review, by the way, that helps us a ton on the podcasts. And we're not three hours a day. We're not four hours a day. We're 25 minutes. If you listen to double speed like I do, we're 12 minutes a day. Uh, so it's just a great daily briefing. We put a lot of work into it. And I'm literally flying overnight, taping a, a show tomorrow because we've got so much to cover and we are not going to let you down. So follow us, Human Events Sale, if you listen to Apple Podcasts. Books are over in the corner, everybody. Come get some books. And please, please, please. Take some selfies. I, the people I recognize in here tonight, I know, are activists who take their what they learn out into the world. 
please don't just take this home and keep it to yourself. If you read the book, share the book. If you like what you heard, share this man's social media, his last name, so people can find him himself. None of this does any of us any good if it stays in this room. God bless you all, and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.